All right, here we go. So this week we're continuing on from what we started last week, and as Jake said earlier, we're talking about the path to overcoming anxiety, and this is going to be part two. The path to overcoming anxiety. If you are a note taker, you may want to take some notes today. Um, I mean, it's easy for me to say I wrote this, but um, I happen to think there's some good stuff in here today that we could actually apply to our lives and really, really make a difference. Um, Listen to this. 84% of Americans, that's a pretty high number, 84% of Americans say they are extremely or very worried. 84%. That is a lot. Now, flip that over, only about 42% of Americans describe themselves as extremely or very hopeful. Apparently, some of those people are very worried and very hopeful at the same time. So I'm not sure how this survey, the math works out, but what I got from this is there are twice as many people that are extremely or very worried or anxious than there are hopeful. And I bet you there's quite a handful of us in here that would put ourselves into that category and say, man, I've got something or some things in my life right now. Um, You want to know what would make me very anxious and worried? Feeding a couple few thousand meals a day. That would make me anxious. So Pastor Timothy, I'm going to preach to you. I'm not saying you have anxiety or worry, but man, if I had your job, count me in on that. Now, Please understand, um, and I said this last week, and I want to make sure I say this again this week, I, I know how serious anxiety is. I know that there is anxiety and mental disorders that require uh, medical uh, therapy, uh, prescription medications. I'm not downplaying any of that. I am all for that. I, I am asking you, if you battle with this, that you... You need to deal with it in a medical way. Um, We're not going to downplay that. Now, at the same time as I say that, we're going to make some jokes today. We're going to have some fun with this, and we're going to look at a biblical prescription on anxiety and worry. But uh, again, I want you to know I'm not downplaying anybody that might be clinically suffering from um, anxiety. Um, If you've got your Bibles, hopefully you do, or there's one right in front of you, turn to Philippians chapter 4. This is where we were looking at last week. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 uh, are said to be some of the key verses dealing with mental health uh, in all of Scripture, much less in the Bible. So Philippians 4, 6, and 7, I want to read through both of our verses, and then we're going to do a little quick review so we can bring those of you who were not here last week, we can bring you guys up to speed and then finish this thing out. So here we go, Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Some big verses right there. And verse 6, it starts out, it says, do not be anxious about anything, which we read that, and again, here's a warning, I don't want you to read that first part of verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, and go, yeah, see, that's not realistic. See, you don't know what's going on in my life. That's great. Maybe that works for the little things. Maybe, I, I know God can step into my life and, you know, make some of these things a little better or maybe just a, a little more tangible or, but, but, <sighs> What I have going on in my life now, that's kind of my responsibility. I, 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 it's, it's asking a little bit too much to say, do not be anxious about anything. But if we can get past that first phrase, which that's, that's where we stopped. If you're new here, or you're just visiting, that's as far as we got all last week. Okay, I'm one of those guys. And I promise we're going to finish out the rest of the two verses today. But if you can get past that part and trust in the rest of those two verses, it is an absolute game changer 
in your life. So do not be anxious about anything. So here we go. The path to overcoming anxiety. We're going to look at four steps, four different ways to see anxiety and how to deal with it, anxiety or worry. So number one, the path to overcoming anxiety, we have to recognize the problem. We have to see anxiety or worry for what it really is. Uh, a, A very wise person once said, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do. There's a lot of movement, but it doesn't actually take you anywhere. That's what worry is like. I mean, you're, you're just constantly moving and going back and forth, but it didn't do any good. And in fact, it, it did harm, and we looked last week about all of the, the mental and physical ways and the spiritual ways that worry and anxiety actually harm our bodies. And I want to review this because we're going to kind of poke into this a little bit more. But that word anxious, it's translated in in the Greek from merimnao. Merimnao, the word means worry, anxious, or care. And that that verse, and we're going to see it here in a minute, cast all your cares upon God because he cares for you. That's what that same word, merimnao. And it's made from the two words merizo which is to separate, tear, or divide into parts, and nous, which is the mind. So if you actually look at this word, that it's, it's we see anxious, but it really means to separate, divide, or tear the mind into parts. Think about it. That's what anxiety does, doesn't it? When we worry about things and we're just constantly thinking about them and, and they're just we have all those just physical reactions, that is what's happening. Our mind is being torn into part, and it's, it's actually what's happening is taking reality, and, and, and we're, our mind is straying from reality to a place where God never intends our minds to go, to something that's not even real and probably not even going to happen. And our definition for anxiety is when your mind is overcome or divided between legitimate and destructive thoughts and concerns. See, there are very, very legitimate concerns that we have to deal with. I am not one of those guys that's going to stand up here and say, hey, listen, I got it. Become a Christian, get some Jesus on you, and everything is going to be better. I'm never, ever, ever going to tell you that. Now, will things get better? Absolutely. Will your life change for the better? Absolutely. But will just everything magically get better because you have Jesus in your life? That's not how it works. By the way, it didn't work that way for Jesus. And so we're still going to have these things that we have to deal with in life. So really, the big decision is how are you going to deal with them? How are you going to deal with these problems and these diagnoses and these relational issues and and just strife and, and all of this stuff? How are you going to deal with it when, not if, when it comes your way? Anxiety says, God, I just don't trust you enough to fully give this to you. When we are anxious, when we worry, when we let those things play over and over and over in our minds, we're basically telling God, God, I don't trust you enough to give this to you, or I I just maybe I don't think that you can handle it, or maybe I'm not worthy for you to step into my life to, to take this over for me. That's what anxiety says. And God's going, give it to me. I'm right here. Why are you holding this back? I want to take this from you. So the path to overcoming anxiety, number one, we've got to recognize the problem. We've got to see what anxiety is. We've got to see when we are doing it. When we are worrying, we've got to catch it. Number two, we've got to experience the prescription, Experience the prescription. And and we said the prescription was right there in the beginning of verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. The prescription is, ready, don't do it. 
which seems a little unfair, right? I mean, it's, it seems a little bit like, really, Trev, that's the best that you can do is to say, the way to not worry is to not worry. Awesome. Listen, I could have written that sermon, bro. I get it. It's not my words, okay? It's Paul's words being spoken to from God. But in the Greek, it actually says, stop worrying about even one thing. That's what the text says right there. Now, I, I, I did some more and more research and reading this week. I, I want you to hear this. this. To me, this is fascinating. This really, from a, a human perspective, maybe we'll, we'll step away from the biblical perspective here, but just from a human perspective, I want you to hear some statistics on this. Researchers at Cornell University conducted a study, and they discovered that 85%, that's a big number, right? Out of 100, 85% of what people worried about never happened. 85% of the time when we worry or we are anxious about something, it never actually happens. That's a big deal. Now, Maybe in this circumstance, as I would be, you're might being more of a glass half empty kind of guy. And you're like, okay, 85 out of 100 is a big number, but we're dealing with my life here. And so we'll flip that around. 15% is actually still a pretty big number, isn't it? You have a 15% chance of having legitimate worry. Well, maybe, watch this, that goes on. It says, of the 15% of worries that came to fruition, 79% of the time, people handled those problems better than they thought they would. So 79%, I know we're, we're going math here, of the 15% wasn't nearly as bad as they thought. Now we're really, really, really getting up there to where you really didn't have to worry about it. It goes further. Watch this. Of those 79% of people that said, hey, it really wasn't as bad, many of them also reported that they learned something very valuable from the experience. So not only was it not as negative as they thought it would be, but it was actually almost more of a positive thing where they learned something and they grew from that. You ready for a little bit more math? Here we go. I don't know, like, I'm, listen, I'm not a math guy, okay? I don't know how they did this, but they had some formula and worked up. So here we go. If you do the math, 97% of the things we worry about, according to this study and those, those figures right there, 97% either never happen or we handle them and possibly learn something valuable about them. 97% percent of the time, it wasn't nearly as big of a deal as we made it. Now, again, you're probably like me, and you're like, okay, I like 97 better than 85, but we got 3% left, don't we? And those are actual legitimate circumstances where we were worried, we were concerned, we, we maybe had some foresight, we thought ahead, something was possibly going to happen, and boom, that thing happened. And I don't want to just say, oh, just give it to God, he'll take care of it, let's focus on the 97%. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to focus on the 3%. Because I believe that we have an amazing big God that can handle your 3% all day long. Amen? All right, so here we go. What do we do with that 3%? The path to overcoming anxiety, number one, we've got to recognize the problem. Number two, we've got to experience the prescription. Number three, we've got to stop and pray. Stop and pray. You're probably going, okay, again, I could have written this sermon because it says it right there in the verse. Yes, it is that simple. That when we are anxious, when we are worried, when those thoughts are creeping into our minds, 
We have to stop and pray and give it to God. Now, before we get to the pray part, there's something very specific we need to stop doing. Um, A little trivia here. There is a two-word question that is absolutely destructive to our thoughts when we are having anxiety or when we are worrying. What's that two-word question we always say? Oh, I'm so happy you guys got it. As I was thinking about this, I was like, I mean, I know it. Are they going to get it? What if? What if? Isn't that where worry and anxiety start? I mean, it's okay. You've got a situation. You've got to deal with it. And then that two-word question pops into your mind. What if that happens? What happens after that? What, 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 what am I going to do at that point? And all of a sudden, your mind is spinning, and you have detached reality from what's happening. And that's when the enemy just creeps right in, and that, that word meramnao tears or divides our minds apart. I think we need to stop asking what if and start giving our cares to God. I already said it, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I I love that word cast. In in a fishing community, obviously, we can kind of see that, and I love that word, that analogy, and and I think of it like, okay, so we have some offshore fishing. We do some casting. I can think, you know, I've been several times on the bow of the boat, and you see a big dolphin or a sailfish, and you're casting your bait to them, or maybe you're in the back country. And, and you're, you're kind of stalking the mangroves, you know, and if you're really cool, you've got that kind of side pitch where you can skip your bait up under the mangroves. Okay, that's really cool. But I think there's a little better analogy, and I don't beach fish, but I, I've seen a lot of videos and stuff, and like, you ever, you ever watch guys that beach fish, or maybe like if, if you're passing the bridges, they, they have these fishing poles that are like 10 feet long, Right? And I mean, if you, if you get a big heavy bait and you get a 10 foot long fishing pole and you throw that thing, I mean, you can really chuck it, right? I mean, better than like a little, you know, six and a half, seven foot, you know, casting rod. I mean, you can, you can get it out there pretty far, but they're doing something different now. Maybe you've seen the videos. These guys are, they're like huge, huge on social media and there's like shark fishermen and like, you know, there's people swimming at the beach and these guys are shark fishing and catching hundreds of pounds of sharks, right? So they're not casting their baits anymore. What are they using? They're using drones. What are you talking about? Okay. I grew up down here fishing. We never used drones, but they have a drone and they will take the bait way, way, way offshore, a couple hundred yards out there and drop this big, massive bait and catch like a 300 pound bull shark or hammerhead right in between all the people swimming. It's awesome. You got to check it out. (laughs) I hate sharks, by the way. Okay. So when I look at this verse, cast all your cares, I'm not talking about the cool little backcountry flip. I'm not even talking about pitching to a dog. I mean, I'm talking like the drone, like, like get it as far away as possible. And that's what this verse here, Peter, is telling us to do. Just, just throw them as hard as you can at God. Why? Why can we do that? Because he cares for us. Because he wants to take those burdens and those worries and that anxiety away from us. Stop and pray. That first part of that verse again, do not be anxious about anything. So there's the stop. You got to stop doing it. Now, this is where I left it, as I told you last week. That, that's as far as we got on that verse. And in some ways, I hated leaving it there because... It's almost unfair to tell you just to stop. Here's the remedy to not worry. Stop doing it, okay? And and I know that doesn't sound very compassionate or empathetic because I know there are many of us in this room that deal with worry and anxiety on a daily basis. So I, I don't want to sound unempathetic or just, church, you should just do it. Just do it because... 
God's word says. So I almost didn't want to leave it there last week. However, the moment that I start shying away from God's commands in his word, and it's very, very clear here that it says, don't do it. And then we looked at Jesus saying, don't do it. The moment that I start shying away from the commands of God's word, you guys need to find a new pastor. Because I will not shy away from giving you exactly what is in God's word. But here's the cool thing about it. If God's word says, don't do it, you know what that tells me? Not that he's like this God that commands, not that, not that he's just you know, all about rules. It tells me there is a way for me, that it is possible for me to not worry. And that's awesome. Instead of just being a command, I'm so thankful that Paul didn't leave it there. He gives us an alternative to anxiety and worry. So it says, do not be anxious about anything, but, but, okay, you got past your phrase from last week and you stopped at one word. We're never getting out of here today. We'll get out, I promise. English or grammatically speaking, what kind of a word is but? Conjunction. I see our English majors in here. Does anybody remember the song? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? I know, I, that has nothing to do with the message. I just <laughs> wanted to make you guys talk for a minute. Okay, the word but is a conjunction. It joins things together. Can anybody, this again has nothing to do with it, can anybody tell me all of the conjunctions? One more. No. And, but, or, nor, for, yet. Okay, again, has nothing to do with anything. And I don't know why I remember all these things from school. I can't remember what I'm looking for in the refrigerator, but I can remember all the conjunctions. I can even give you all of the prepositions as well, but you don't want that. We don't have time for it. But, it's a conjunction. It joins things together. And, and that word, but, it's a conjunction of contrast. It says, this, but, this. And in fact, it it's, gives us a better alternative to anxiety or worry. So it says, do not be anxious about anything, but... In every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Did you see the four things in there? There are four very key things in the rest of that verse. Here they are. In every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's like basically a fourfold roadmap in how to do this. Let's walk through these real fast. Prayer, this is basically, in, in my opinion here, it's the umbrella term for speaking to or with God. It says, so you've got to go to God. You've got to take this to God. So in everything, in all of this worry, all of this anxiety, all of your cares, in everything... Uh, by prayer and petition. That word petition means a heartfelt petition or ask arising out of deep personal need. So by prayer and petition means, God, I'm coming to you today. Like, like this is, is heavy on my heart. Like, God, I cannot get these anxious thoughts out of my mind. I cannot get this, I, 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 I just, I can't stop thinking about it. It's consuming me. God, I need to give this to you. That's what it's saying. There's this, almost this desperation that goes with it. So by prayer and petition with what? Thanksgiving. I don't have to define that one. It's the giving of thanks. And you may say, um, yeah, 
if that's me and I'm going to God and things are as hard as they seem, I don't really have a whole lot to give thanks about in this moment. Well, you actually do, regardless of everything else in your life. Regardless of all the rest of the blessing in your life, I'll give you one humongous thing that you have to be thankful for just in your situation of anxiety and worry. You could be thankful that you have a heavenly father that you can go to and cast these burdens to him. That right there, we should be so thankful about. That he cares enough that he's going to sit there and listen and take all of our junk on. That's the heavenly father that I know and love and serve. So by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And that word request means a request or a demand. And and the emphasis in the, the original language is it's a strong request. This is like a plead or almost really a demand. It's saying here that we can almost demand that God take this from us. Now, obviously, there's respect, and I could go off on that. I'm not going to. But we can strongly take this to God and say, God, I need you to take this. I can't handle it anymore. I mean, you could read through Scripture, especially the Psalms, and just see where David and some of the psalmists are pouring out their hearts to God, like, God, you got to take this. I can't do it anymore. Psalm 13 is a great example of that. There's this, this order of prayer that we have to go by. Now, we, we, we do, but we shouldn't pray and say, Dear God, I need blah, 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 right? I mean, we do that, don't we? I do that. You guys are super quiet. I must be the only person that does that, okay? I guess I'm just going to confess in front of a couple few hundred people, okay? But we do that. Now, I'm not saying it's like if, if you're passing an accident or something and you say, God, I just pray that you would be with those people, just whatever is going on. And this, like, okay, that's okay. But what I'm saying is when we go to prayer, when we are going to approach God, there is a bit of an order of things that should happen first. It's not that God doesn't hear your prayers. I'm pretty inclined to hear, to believe that God hears whatever he wants to hear, okay? But there's this kind of order. Um, Is there an example in Scripture of how we ought to pray? What do we call that? The Lord's Prayer, right. Okay, if you, if you want to turn there real quick, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is speaking here in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, this then is how you should pray. Now, before we go on, I love the Lord's Prayer. It is okay to pray the Lord's Prayer word for word. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. What I don't want you to do is just repetitiously pray it, not really know what it means, and and, and just think that you get credit for that. I think if you know what these words and these phrases and the heart behind it means, it is great and wonderful, and I suggest you pray the Lord's Prayer. But that's not what Jesus was getting at. Jesus was saying, hey, when you pray, this, here's kind of a model of how you should do it. So here we go. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's break this down a little bit. Our Father in heaven, God, <laughs> you are on the throne in heaven. Like you have angels surrounding you all of the time singing holy, holy, holy. Like you created all things, like like you are holy and I am not. Okay, that was just the, the first line there. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name respected, revered, like glorified. You're you're you are so awesome that your name is like to be revered and respected. That's how awesome you are, God. And then it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. What, what's the reverse of that? My kingdom come, my will be done. So right there you're praying, hey, God, 
what you've got going on is way more important than what I've got going on. I'm about to bring you some stuff, Lord, but, but your kingdom, your will be done. Like, like it's, it's all about you. God, I know you care for me, so I'm going to give you my stuff, but, but your stuff is first. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, everything is perfect up there. Everything is ran by you up there. That's how I want it to be here. Okay, that was the very first part of the Lord's Prayer, right? What did we just do? What's that called? I'll give you a hint. We talked about it a few weeks ago. What did we do? Worship. We just worshiped. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about how important worship is, and worship's not just singing, although we can worship while we're singing, but, but, but worship, actually the definition is an expression of our devotion and gratitude due to a realization of God's holiness and goodness. That's what worship is. And the very first part of the Lord's Prayer is worship. God, you are holy, I am not. Recognizing God for who he is and recognizing you for who you are and for who I am. So after we go through all of that and we have this awesome time of worship, what's the very next line of the Lord's Prayer? Give us today our daily bread. Do you see the order right there? Now we can start asking for stuff. Now we can go to God and tell him our needs. We've recognized who he is. We worship him. We recognize our place in this world. And we say, okay, God, here's what I need. Give us today our daily bread. Like, like just, just, God, I'm just asking you for some needs here. What's Paul getting at? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. He's saying, worship instead of worry. That's what Paul is saying here. When you, when you are When you feel that worry coming up in you, worship. Go to God and worship him. Get the focus off your issues and put your focus onto a holy God. I've heard it said, worry and worship cannot exist in the same heart. I don't know that that's necessarily theologically accurate 100% of the time. I think it's better said like this, worry cancels worship. When we worry, it it basically, it cancels out the worship, whatever worship that we have. However, flip that over, worship cancels worry. When you have worry in your heart, you just start worshiping God. God, you're in charge. You're awesome. I'm not. I know what I have going on in my life seems like a lot to me, and it is. But God, you, you sit on the throne in heaven. God, you are in control. God, God you've got this. And God, I, I may not feel it right now or see it, but God, I know your word tells me that you love me more than I love me. And that you want better for me than I want for me. So God, I'm just going to trust you, whatever it is that, that's happening in my life, that you're in control, that you know best, and I'm going to keep my eyes focused on you. I promise you, if you take that to God like that, with that heart, and, and keep that mindset, because it's really easy to say that once and go right back to your worry. But if you keep that mindset, worship cancels worry. Worship drowns the voice of worry and prepares the heart for peace. That's what worship does. It prepares our hearts for something even better. Like, like it's really awesome to not worry anymore, right? Like, if you're really worried or really anxious... Like, not doing it anymore sounds like a good enough reward. But Paul here in just a minute is saying, wait a minute, there's something even better that I have for you. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The path to overcoming anxiety, number one, recognize the problem. Number two, experience the prescription. Number three, stop and pray. Number four, trust the promise. Trust the promise. What was our conjunction in verse six? But, okay. In verse six, it says, don't do this, but do this. All right, that's what it says. Don't do this, but do this. But then when you look from verse six to verse seven, we have another conjunction. So verse six says, don't do this, but do this. And then verse 7 says, and this will happen. And if you do this thing, if you, if you don't worry, this amazing thing will happen. Trust the promise. What's the promise? Verse 7. And the what? The peace of God which transcends, and I love that word, it means surpasses, is greater than, is bigger than. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Our word merimnao again, to separate, divide, or tear the mind into parts. Look towards the end of verse 7. It says, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will, what's that word? Guard your hearts. This word actually refers to military soldiers standing guard on something. And, and in this day, it would have been Roman soldiers. So we can, you know, we've seen the movies and all that. We can picture Roman soldiers, right? They've got their swords. They've got their spears. And this word that Paul uses is like your heart and your mind, those things that are absolutely torn into pieces um, when you trust God, when you don't worry, when you worship him, when you give it to God, God will set a guard, a Roman guard around your heart and your mind to protect it from being torn into pieces. That's a pretty cool promise, isn't it? So how does this work in everyday life? Number one, recognize the problem. Call it out. No, no. This is anxiety. This is worry. This is that thing I'm not supposed to do. Because in the moment, it's going to look like you're concerned about something. And we use that lingo, don't we? I'm just trying to figure this out. No, you're being anxious about something. So number one, recognize the problem. Call it out. Number two, experience the prescription. Hey, God tells me not to worry. I'm doing that thing again. I'm I'm being anxious. God told me not to do this thing. I've got to not do it. Number three, stop and pray. Here's a prayer. We're going to put them together here in a minute. God, you are greater and stronger than my problem, and I want to worship you over worrying about things. Stop and pray. And number four, trust the promise. God, I trust that your peace will supernaturally overshadow my illegitimate thoughts and legitimate concerns. So the path to overcoming anxiety, maybe you didn't see it yet. I worked really hard on this. I spent like five minutes. Number one, R, recognize the problem. Number two, E, experience the prescription Number three, S, stop and pray. And number four, T, trust the promise. What does that spell? I feel like a cheerleader. (laughs) That was really weird. (laughs) Rest. If you want rest, there's the solution. I've said it many times, and we joke about it, Usually worry and anxiety, when do they creep in? Like 3 a.m., right? 4 a.m., 5 a.m., worry and anxiety. Our mind just starts to just wind, just spinning and spinning and spinning. If you want rest, here it is. I want to end on these verses right here. It's Matthew 11, 
starting in verse 28. Jesus speaking. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to picture Jesus saying this to you. Not, not saying it in its original context. Not you're in here with a few hundred people. But picture yourself standing before Jesus and him saying this directly to you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You can open your eyes if you had them closed. It's a little different when you picture Jesus speaking that directly to you and over you, isn't it? Man, is it really possible that we could not worry about things? Have legitimate concerns? Yes. Deal with problems? Yes. Have to figure it out? Absolutely. But man, if we could just stop worrying and stop anxiety, what a game changer that would be in our lives. So here's our closing prayer. You may want to take a picture of this. This is something that we ought to be praying over our lives every single day. God, you are greater and stronger than my problem. I want to worship you over worrying about things and trust that your peace will supernaturally overshadow my illegitimate thoughts and legitimate concerns. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are a God that cares. God, there are so many wrong and illegitimate versions of you in this world. And I'm so grateful that we believe the truth, that you are a God who loves us, who cares for us, who sees our daily wants and needs who knows the things that we are going through in life, who knows the struggles that we're dealing with. Thank you, God, that you know us in such intimate ways. You know the number of hairs on our head. You know every little detail of our lives. And God, not only do you know those facts, But God, you love us in such a way that you sent the very best, most precious thing that you had to die for us, Jesus. Thank you, God, that we don't have to live with fear, that we can rise above all of the junk that this life throws us. God, help us to trust you when that junk comes. God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you and continuously worship you. God, I know this morning with so many people here, God, I know that there are people here who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. They've never made an actual decision to let you be their savior, to let you be the Lord of their lives. So right now, God, in this moment, will you speak to those hearts? God, to those who do not know you personally, right now, would you show them their need for a savior? And heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you you know that you don't have that relationship with Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. 
If that's you, if you say, you know what, I, I, I've, I've believed some stuff. I've maybe counted on my church attendance. I've tried to be a good person. Those are all great things, but none of those things are going to save you. None of those things will get you into eternity with Jesus. But right now in this moment, would you just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you to come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. God, save me. Change me. I give you my life. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you said that today for the very first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out, but I'd just love to know to be praying for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, today I got it. Today I decided to start a relationship with Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? Today is the day I decided to give my life to Jesus to be Lord of my life. I don't want to run my life anymore. God, I want you to be in charge of my life. Thank you, God, for those this morning who decided to give everything to you. God, we we know that that is such a simple thing because you have given everything to us. Thank you that you are Savior. Thank you that through Jesus Christ, dying a miserable death on a cross, but rising again three days later, that we can know that we have eternity with you. God, thank you for this church and what you're doing. Thank you for our growth. God, may we not just grow in numbers, but God, we, may we grow deep as well. God, help us to have a burden to make the invisible God visible. Thank you for Pastor Timothy and what he is doing. God, I just pray that you would bless him, equip him. God, expand his ministry. God, if it be your will, would you give them the resources to get this land, to feed more children and not just intake food but food for their soul so that they can share the love of Jesus with these kids and with these families thank you God that you are a God who cares God we pray for this time of offering thank you God that we are part of a generous church help us God to use it in a way that is going to further your kingdom God your kingdom come Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray all of this in the awesome, mighty, and holy name of Jesus. Amen.